I'd like to begin by telling you about a gentleman named Daniel Kevlis, who wrote a classic book which is entitled, In the Name of Eugenics, Genetics and the Uses of Human Hereditary. Heredity. Now let me tell you why this man says he wrote this book. He says he wrote it partly because of his recognition that eugenics casts a shadow over all contemporary discourse concerning human genetic manipulations. He himself was a physicist, and his background in physics, and, the, and, and he notes in the introduction to this book, how unprepared we were to deal with the momentous issues that the release of nuclear energy, a feat requiring only a few years of concentrated effort, suddenly compelled us to confront in 1945, end quote. The great British biologist, J.B.S. Haldane, declared in 1963 that genetic modification of man was likely to be millennia away. But he added, I remember that in 1935, I regarded nuclear energy as an improbable source of power. Kevles in his book goes on to add that, quote, the acquisition of the knowledge and techniques for human genetic intervention would pose challenges which, while different in kind from those of the nuclear revolution, may be comparable in magnitude, and it is none too soon to examine them in historical context, end quote. Or to quote Albert Einstein about his role in the development of nuclear power and the atomic bomb, quote, the real problem is in the hearts and the minds of men. It is not a problem of physics, but of ethics. It is easier to denature plutonium than to denature the evil spirit of man, end quote. Similarly, it may be easier to create human life in vitro than it is to create the wisdom to develop the ethics for the appropriate use of our powerful new genetic techniques. Our first speaker, Dr. Sandra Carson, will continue our program on medical ethics by discussing pre-implantation genetic diagnoses. PGD, as it is called, the first of these powerful techniques I mentioned, and it's the first, the first technique actually to bridge the effort to assist human production, human reproduction, and the ability to intervene in human heredity. What that enables us to do is to project the healing hands of medicine into the ova and inject medical science into the innermost workings of early human life. So let me tell you about Dr. Carson and why she's so eminently qualified to discuss this topic with us tonight. She is professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and director of the Division of Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility at the Warren Alpert Medical School at Brown University. From 1998 until her recent move to Rhode Island, she was professor of obstetrics and gynecology right here at Baylor and director of Baylor's assisted reproduction, reproductive technology. She has been recognized by her for clinical expertise, including the design of surgical instruments for hysteroscopic surgery. She's also been recognized in Best Doctors in America for more than 10 years and is, and is included regularly in Good Housekeeping's 401 Best Doctors for Women. Maybe she'll even explain to us how they arrived at the number 401. <laughs> also, she's been included regularly in Houston's Top Doctors list and the Guide to America's Top Doctors. In addition to her busy clinical practice, Dr. Carson has published over 90 scientific papers five books, and over 50 chapters in medical textbooks. She is the editor-in-chief and associate editor for several medical journals and has played an active role in many professional organizations and governmental agencies. Dr. Carson has served as vice president of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, as well as the president of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. Finally, Dr. Carson's research has been funded for 18 years by the National Institutes of Health. Please joining, join me in welcoming Dr. Carson back to Houston. Thank you. Thank you for those kind words. And I really appreciate um, not only being back in Houston 
since it's still my home. I've only been uh, out of Houston for six months, but I really appreciate the opportunity to um, share with you today um, what really I do and um, uh, what I think is the most interesting part of medicine. Um, <clears throat> what I'd like to do today is um, talk to you about pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, but before we do that, um, I want to review for you a little bit about these techniques um, themselves. This is Louise Brown. She was the first, the world's first test tube baby. She was born in 1978. And besides giving infertile women a chance to be parents, she did a huge amount of medical education because we had never before seen the first human cellular division. And now we not only have seen it and understand how it happens, when it happens, we also are beginning to understand how to control what happens to it. Today, what I'd like to do is talk to you about um, assisted reproductive technology, a little bit about the risks and the benefits, how we apply it clinically, and then hopefully provoke a little bit of your thinking about should we really be doing this? Before I do that, let me tell you about the ABCs of ART. And we so common in our field use um, letters to talk about these techniques. Sometimes we don't um, remember that all of you might not be as, um, familiar with those letters. So let me just go through a little bit of the abbreviations I'll be using today. ART is assisted reproductive technology and it encompasses all of the techniques we'll talk about today. IVF is in vitro fertilization, the classic test tube baby. ICSI, I-C-S-I, is intracytoplasmic sperm injection, and I'll tell you what that is. PGD is pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, and then PCR and FISH are the techniques that we use to diagnose embryos before implantation. Now, when a woman usually is infertile, uh, or a couple is infertile, she goes through in vitro fertilization oftentimes to have a baby. This is the first technique that we use um, in assisted reproductive technology to, um, to uh, have embryos for genetic diagnosis. And basically, what a woman does in in two weeks of her menstrual cycle, has her blood tests, her, her blood measured for estrogen, which goes up uh, in the first two weeks of the cycle. And then using an ultrasound machine such as this, she has her follicles uh, measured. The, um, <clears throat> let's see if I can clip this. The top black um, line, this is an ultrasound, and um, the top black space is the bladder, here is the uterus, and here are the ovaries. And if you'll watch this ovary as we go through, when a woman is put on drugs and followed with those blood levels that we saw rise, her ovary also begins to grow and develop follicles. Under ultrasound guidance, we're able to take a needle and just press it pass it through the vagina into one of those follicles which contain an egg, aspirate the egg and uh, into a trap, a test tube, which we pass um, under very sterile conditions and a defined media into a room where a uh, technician isolates the egg from the fluid we give her. Um, the environment is controlled at 37 degrees centigrade body temperature and under specific lighting and atmospheric conditions. We can isolate the egg, which is the largest cell in the human body, and has a zona pellucida around it and cells which feed it, the corona radiata. We mix it with sperm um, in a petri dish such as this, baby's first nursery, um, and 18 hours later, uh, the egg is fertilized. The, um, it, takes about, it takes 18 hours to fertilize a human egg, and then the first cell division occurs at 24 hours. Now, sometimes couples are infertile because there aren't very many sperm, or sometimes there are no sperm at all, and we can get sperm from the testicle or from the tubes around it. But then we have to use the procedure, which um, I 
uh, told you was ICSI. Now we put the sperm in polyvinyl propyl pyridol, which is sort of a cross between k syrup and antifreeze. And <clears throat> that slows it down and we're able to take the sperm and then break off its tail. If we don't break off its tail, it swims out of the egg. Typical male, right? <laughs> um, the, um, the egg is then injected, I'm sorry, the sperm is then injected into the egg and um, fertilization, and you can see the sperm right there about to go into the egg. So we don't need, we really only need one sperm for this one egg, and we don't need the millions of sperm normally found in the ejaculate. Um, we put, as I said, uh, 18 hours later, we can see that the chromosomes from the sperm and from the egg are within, um, are about to combine. And then at 24 hours, we have a, um, an embryo, a two-cell embryo, and then six hours later, the second cell division occurs. And as you can see, this is a little boy who is actually now not so little. He's uh, 24 years old in Chicago. Um, that's the four-cell embryo. Now, every one of these cells has, again, another boy, um, the, every one of these cells has the genetic components of every cell in the baby that results and in the adult that results from that baby. So we are able to take one of these cells and genetically test it and predict what uh, genotype, not predict, but actually diagnose what genotype that baby's going to have. And we do that, and let me tell you, this is about um, 1 30th the diameter of a human hair. So that's the size that we're working with. And we can remove one of those cells and then genetically test it. We use a technique like you've heard in the, during the O.J. Simpson trial, PCR, where we magnify the DNA thousands and thousands and thousands of times. And then we're able to put it on gels and actually separate different kinds of genes or different markers that we can use. Here we're separating the DNA on a gel that can tell uh, embryonic sex. And those um, with two different lines, the Y chromosome and the X chromosome, um, is a, from a male embryo. And those with only one line, uh, the X chromosome, from the X chromosome, is, of course, the female embryo. Um, we can also label different chromosomes. And these are actually cells which are, have colored labels on chromosomal probes which bind to the various cells. Now, those are difficult to just look under the microscope with the na uh, naked eye. So we use some computer enhancement to actually look at the chromosomes. And this is pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, PGD. You can see that this cell now has two yellow or X chromosomes, so it's from a female embryo, but look, it also has three number 21 chromosomes. If this were embryo were transferred and resulted in a baby, this baby would be born with Down syndrome. If we culture the embryos to, for five days in the laboratory, they turn into a blastocyst, and this is a blastocyst. It has about 200 cells. These cells will turn into the placenta, they're called trophectoderm, and these cells are the intercell mass which will become the baby. Just tuck that away in your um, mind for a minute because these are the cells that I'll show you are cultured to become embryonic stem cells, all the hoopla you heard about in the um, media. We transfer the embryo back and mom magically nine months later makes it into a baby. It's very difficult, at least for me, to transfer a four-cell embryo and then one year later hold this and not believe in God. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit more about pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. One can do it for just about any genetic defect that we have chromosomal probes for. So we can do it for a variety of disorders. Autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, X-linked, and chromosomal disorders. And yes, because we can diagnose which embryos have X and Y chromosomes, we can do it for elective sex selection. Let me show you what we can do. Now this little boy has Lesch-Nyhan syndrome. He has a mutation on his X chromosome that um, causes him to have a genetic disorder, a, an enzyme deficiency, which causes him to mutilate himself. <clears throat> he has normal intelligence, so he knows what he can do. His arms and legs are tied to the bed because if 
they weren't, he would eat his hands and legs. You can't, um, you can't immobilize the mandible or the jawbone. So what he has done is actually eaten his upper lip. He knows what he's doing, and he doesn't want to do it. But he um, can't help himself. Now, his um, brothers have a 50% chance of having this disorder. And so we are able to diagnose fetal sex, as in the way that I've shown you, and then transfer only female embryos, which will not have the disease. His parents um, opted to go through genetic diagnosis for Lesh Nyhan, for X, actually for an X-marrying um, embryo. So we transferred only females um, in his mother, and he has a sister now. So we're able to prevent families from having recurrence of very severe diseases, and we can do that uh, with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. But there are some risks. There is a lower implantation uh, rate and a lower blastocyst formation. Um, we can kill the embryos, and we can also make misdiagnosis. We're working at the amount of DNA that's very, very small and have to amplify it, and sometimes we can make mistakes. Um, also, the parents themselves in some diseases may gain information about their own carrier status that they might not know, and we can talk about this a little bit in more detail when we have time. But studies have now shown that there's no risk of anomalies after pre-implantation compared to the baseline risk of IVF itself. Now let me guess, just go over a few of the studies we have to prove the safety of ART. Uh, this Australian study shows that the birth defect rate after IVF or after GIF is about the same as one would expect in the general population. A large study in uh, France found the same thing. Um, another study looking at developmental anomalies after the birth of the baby found no difference in malformations, height, weight, or scholastic performance in babies born after IVF compared to uh, babies born from infertile women. A case control study um, in the UK looking at registries also found there was no difference. However, probably one of the um, most commonly quoted studies is the Australian study that looked at babies born from in vitro fertilization and found no differences in malformation and growth and development when compared to other infertile women. However, um, there are some systematic uh, reviews. When one compares IVF babies to um, fertile women that do show some problems. Um, when IVF babies are compared to babies in the normal population, there's a slightly higher birth defect rate, and I'll show you some of the results. But that's because that babies born from infertile women also have a slightly higher rate. So it's probably the disease rather than the technique that's resulting in these um, malfor malformations. Um, a large panel in the John, Kathy Hudson and the group at the, uh, from the Johns Hopkins Public Health Institute has shown that the evidence is suggestive of no association between ART and overall serious anomalies. And this is the data from um, Australia, from Hansen, that showed that compared to the general population, there may be uh, as high as a 30% increase in uh, births in um, the infertile population. However, in the studies that Dr. Hansen looked at, they had a lot of variations. This is actually the range in the, um, in the chances. And when these lines cross one, it means it's not significant. So most of the studies show no significant abnormality rate. But every once in a while, there is a study which does show a significance. Most of these studies are compared to, as I said, a fertile population. Now, there are some difficulties that we have in just looking at the safety of art. There are multiple drugs used. There's a myriad of cultural variables. And it's difficult to tell just how safe these techniques are because so many things are involved. 
So last week you heard um, Dr. Cass um, speak um, here in this lecture series, and he was the chair, as you know, of the President's Council on Bioethics, and his committee recommended that federally funded studies be performed on patients, on babies born after IVF and after uh, PGD. And in um, January of 2004, the Genetics and Public Policy Center from Johns Hopkins School of Public Health called for the same thing. Two weeks ago, the National Children's Study was funded um, by Congress, and we, uh, from the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, urged them to also include the IVF population, but they did not um, include that population. So we still don't have a funded study that will really give us very good numbers and um, outcome for these. But there is a PGD database working group that was uh, convened by the centers that I told you about, and they wanted to define a precise data set that would actually help us determine the safety of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. And they, do, they, they did look at a variety of focus groups and um, a variety of outcomes from centers doing performing both IVF and PGD and found that it was difficult, again, to conclude because of the heterogeneous indications of patients that use IVF that most studies showed no increased anomalies overall, but any single anomaly that might arise was difficult to detect because of just the small numbers in all the studies, had low power for a single anomaly. Also, as I've said, it was difficult. Do you con control these patients against an infertile population? It's hard to do that because infertile couples oftentimes don't have babies. And it's difficult um, to make conclusions when you compare it to fertile couples. And there are a myriad of technical variables. But they did conclude that overall, the mal malformation rate was unlikely to be increased. But if it was increased, it was unlikely to exceed 30%. And that there may be a, an anomaly introduced by ICSI or by PGD, um, and that probably was related to the problems where the procedure was done themselves. Male factor infertility probably causes abnormal sperm, which cause um, abnormalities in the offspring, rather than the procedure itself. So I think that we can assume that IVF and PGD are safe. There may be a small increase in abnormalities, and that increased risk is probably worth um, undertaking the technique to avoid the disease that these techniques are set out to avoid. However, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis also brings us the, the ability to look at diseases and prevent embryo transfer and to look at certain characteristics such as sex, which is not a disease, and allow people to select for the sex of their offspring. Should we be doing this? What diseases should we select against? Should we select against particular genetic markers that lead to disease? For example, um, BRCA1 and 2, the hallmark uh, markers of breast cancer right now. Should we select um, embryos? We can diagnose that in embryos. Should we be diagnosing it and not transferring those? Um, and finally, I want to talk to you, if we have time, about somatic cell nuclear transfer, which is called therapeutic cloning. Because after we make the diagnosis, it's tempting to treat the abnormal embryos. And we need to be thinking right now about whether we should be doing these. Now, this is actually a difficult slide, but it shows you that in, women, in couples in the United States, uh, about 63% of them would like to have a boy as their first child. Now, let me just take you through this in the interest of time. To those um, couples who have two children, um, if they have two boys, about 15% of them would like a third boy, and 85% would like a third child as a girl. If they have two girls, the reverse is true. But if they have one boy and one girl, about 50% of them want a girl and 50% of them want a boy. 
So although in the United States there's a little bit of a tendency to want a male as a first child, by the time that child is born, pretty much everybody wants either a child of the opposite gender or um, a 50% um, half um, want a girl or a boy after two or after one of each. Now it's also interesting that even couples who have either two boys or two girls, uh, about a half of, a quarter of them actually want to have a third child, as opposed to only about a fifth of couples who have one of each. So sex selection in this country probably would not change the number of boys and girls born um, after maybe an initial period, but they would, um, but it would perhaps offer um, a decrease in the population. If we do this and select embryos for family balancing so that couples have one boy and one girl or two boys and two girls, um, then there's always a question of what you do with the child of the undesired sex, which is a healthy embryo. Um, it can be frozen. Um, to perhaps if the couples change their minds or maybe even indefinitely. It can be donated to research or to another infertile couple, which is my favorite uh, disposition, or it can be destroyed. So these are the options we have um, when we have these other embryos. Now the American Society for Reproductive um, Medicine uh, the ethics formed an ethics committee to look at whether we should be doing sex selection. And they felt that although this was acceptable for medical reasons, such as the uh, child with Lesh Nyhan syndrome that I showed you about, they felt it was inappropriate for elective sex selection because it reinforced gender bias in society, and they felt it placed an unreasonable demand on the woman, for they alone must go through all the medical risk and all the um, medical encumbrances that we talked about to get to the point of IVF. And they also felt that it identified gender as a reason to value one person over another. And for that reason, they recommended against um, um, performing elective sex selection. They also felt it was an inappropriate use and allocation of medical resources. But they felt that separating X-bearing from Y-bearing sperm was in fact ethical. And one can now separate X-sperm uh, from Y-sperm, but not very efficiently, but somewhat, and then use those sperm to inseminate the egg um, and either the X sperm or the Y sperm, depending on the choice of the couple. However, it's not as effective as pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. And Norbert Gleischer asked, how can he actually ask any institutional review board or any ethical board to consider ethical a procedure which is about 70% effective when another, that is PGD, is virtually 100% effective? So this is a question that right now is uh, debated in many reproductive endocrine circles and certainly in the ASRM um, com ethics committee. So at Baylor, we had actually performed a study looking at whether or not um, pre-implantation genetics was ethical for sex selection. And we felt that it was ethical if done for the second child the sex of the oldest child remaining random. And the reason for that was because there's some advantage so sociologically in, um, in society of that the oldest child has. So we wanted this to remain random. We also felt that couples wanting to have a son and a daughter may be able to limit their offspring to two and be um, population-wise uh, frugal. And any overall alterations in the sex ratio would be reversed once um, that first or second child was born. So we did not feel that it would alter the secondary sex ratio. And finally, we felt if the undesired embryos were donated, then the secondary sex ratio would definitely remain the same. That is, if the couple desiring, let's say, the girl would donate their male embryos to other infertile couples, then would know that boys and girls would remain in equal distribution 
in um, society. However, when we did the study, it's interesting to note that our ethic, that our Institutional Research Review Board um, would not allow us to um, have su limit our um, subjects to only those who would donate their embryos. And the reason for that is they felt that this put undue coercion on those subjects who agreed to be a part of the study. So in uh, my last five minutes, let me tell you a little bit about the next step of using these techniques. And this is somatic cell nuclear transfer. Now, the somatic cell nuclear transfer is sometimes known as reproductive cloning. Now, here is an egg similar to what I've shown you. And let's, this is an egg that's a cat egg. It has 19 chromosomes. And this was actually performed at uh, Texas A&M, in which they removed the chromosomes from an egg, um, making that egg, of course, have zero chromosomes. And they then replaced the egg's chromosomes with the chromosomes from a cell of an adult cat. They then, and that restored the chromosomal number to 38. They then cultured that egg with its implanted nucleus to a blastocyst and returned it to a cat, um, a donor, or a surrogate cat, surrogate mother cat, um, and she became pregnant and delivered a cat which had the identical chromosomes to that cat which donated the nucleus. And Texas A&M called that little cat coffee cat. Um, now, you'll see that um, even though this little cat is an identical twin, if you will, of the nucleus donor, it does look very different, doesn't it? That's because we don't understand why. There's lots of processing going on by this egg, uh, lots of uh, chromosomal expression that changes the um, appearance of that cat. And so there's a lot about reproductive cloning that we don't know. We don't know about the safety towards mother or child. We no don't know what or untoward events might occur in that cat or in that human, should it be done in humans. So the ASRM is against reproductive cloning at this time. But let me tell you a little bit about therapeutic cloning, which looks very, very similar. In the human, with its 23 chromosomes in the egg, the nucleus or the chromosomes from the eggs can be removed and an adult somatic cell replaced, restoring the chromosomal number to 46. And then um, instead of transferring this embryo to a uterus, we can take those cells. Remember I told you to remember about those inner cell mass that would become the, the, the baby. We can take those cells and we can culture them into stem cells, and these are embryonic stem cells. Now, those stem cells will have the same genetic component as the adult cells that donated the nucleus. So when we take them and culture them, we can theoretically add DNA to them, add genes, and maybe have those cells make insulin, so that if you're a diabetic who doesn't have any insulin, we can take one of those stem cells and put in an insulin gene and you can make your own insulin from the cell, theoretically. We can also add growth factors and differentiate these cells into neurons, nerve cells for perhaps a Parkinson patient or skin cells for a burn patient. And because they contain the same proteins and the same antigens as the donor of that nucleus, they won't be rejected. So let's say, theoretically, how we can take that baby now with Lesh Nyhan and treat him. We can take one of his adult cells and put it in an enucleated egg, make stem cells, neurons, from that egg, which would be his. They would have his chromosomal content. And then perhaps put them in his brain that prevents him from doing this and maybe prevent him from mutilating himself. And that's the power of somatic cell nuclear transfer. It's not here yet, but it's upon us. However, 
he has a genetic disease, an X-linked genetic disease. So he, of course, if he's treated, will grow up. And what will happen? He'll want to have a baby. So that means he won't give his disease to any of his children. Because if he gives an X chromosome to his daughters, um, she, she'll have a normal X from her mother, so she won't get the disease. And he'll give the Y chromosome to his sons, so they won't get the disease. But 50% of his grandchildren could get this disease. 50% of his grandsons can get this disease. So before we start talking about diagnosis, we have to talk about which diagnosis we want to diagnose. And then if we link it to therapy, we have to think about the ramifications of our therapy. So should we do it? There's not only ramifications to the patient, but all, also to future offspring and future grand offspring. Um, there are, of course, implications to an embryo and limitations of the technology. But Let's think about it now. Let's keep our minds open. It's hard not to get emotional about it, but let's keep our minds open so we avoid making the courtroom our medical decision arena. Thank you.